Okay, so people are still trickling in, but we want to honor the time and we've set aside an hour for this conversation and we have a lot um, to cover, particularly once we start to hear from Dr. Day. And I want to thank everybody who sent questions in advance. I was just emailing with Christine last night about how excellent and thoughtful the questions were that we received. And so we're definitely going to get to those questions. So with that, uh, our agenda for today is welcome for me, Executive Director of the CCF. I've been in this role since April 2019. Um, and clearly we have our work cut out for us, especially in the last few months of this pandemic. Um, but I lead an incredible team and I'm particularly honored to introduce you all to our new Superstar Director of Litigation, Christine Van Dyne, who's going to speak a bit about um, the results and the work that she's already done, even though she's only been with us for a few weeks, um, particularly as relates to government action in response to the pandemic. Um, and then really the bulk of the time uh, will be, uh, Christine will just speak for a few minutes um, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Day, who I'll introduce before he speaks, but he'll speak about um, the charter litigation that the CCF is proud to be supporting, uh, which is really a charter case which will affect every Canadian. As many of you know, Canada is the only country in the world uh, which outlaws all forms of private insurance and private health, and the outcomes have already been devastating before the pandemic started, and it's become even more clear that we have a real urgent pressing need that is beyond politics and beyond ideology for a release valve. I just saw our law intern uh, shared on his social, and I'll drop it in the chat, a poll that just came out today uh, that was reported in the Globe and Mail that reported that 54% of cancer patients across the country have had screenings, diagnoses, and treatments pushed back as a result of the pandemic. So the epidemic of ballooning wait lists, which obviously have severe health care consequences, has truly been exacerbated by this pandemic. So I think the whole matter of patient choice has been, just been set into dramatic relief um, throughout the pandemic. So I will turn it over to Christine. I'm just going to unmute you and in your video. Um, so welcome to Christine. She'll tell us a bit about her background, what she's been up to, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Day. Hi, thanks, Joanna. Um, yeah, so my name's Christine. I'm the new litigation director with Canadian Constitution Foundation. Uh, I started on June 15th. Before that, I was working for an organization called Canadian Taxpayers Federation, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, where I did public policy advocacy, and I was also involved in a number of significant interventions, including the intervention on the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Act, this is carbon tax legislation, and on the City of Toronto, the size of City of Toronto City Hall litigation, um, where we were making arguments about uh, Section 33. Uh, notwithstanding clause. Uh, so I've been now with CCF for about a month. It'll be a month tomorrow. And uh, in the context of COVID, uh, there are a lot of civil liberties implications. So it's been a busy month uh, doing work related to almost daily government responses to the pandemic um, that have rights implications, um, while at the same time getting caught up with the really significant existing litigation that we have going on. Um, so I'm not trying to just do responsive work uh, in response to daily government actions. Um, my goal is also to focus on a number of issues that are priority to CCF, including property rights and free speech. And I'm hoping to bring a few novel cases and arguments to the organization um, in the in the coming months. So uh, with respect to our ongoing cases, obviously one of our most significant is the Canby litigation in British Columbia that relates to healthcare choice. And that's what Dr. Day is here to speak about today. And um, with that, I guess I'll send it back to you to Joanna to, to introduce Dr. Day. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christine. 
Um, so it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Day. I'm so grateful that he took time out of his schedule to be with us today. Dr. Day is past president of the Canadian Medical Association, past president of the Arthroscopy Association of North America. He's an honorary associate professor at UBC. And of course, he is the owner, founder, and CEO of Candy Surgery Center, which is the largest private medical clinic in Canada, which has treated hundreds of thousands of patients. Um, and of course, he's dedicated his career, although he is from the UK by birth, to improving the Canadian healthcare system and improving outcomes for patients. So I'm going to unmute you, Dr. Day, pin your video. Uh, and Dr. Day will speak to us uh, for as long as he'd like. And then we'll kick off with the questions that were sent to me in advance. And then of course, we will welcome any questions from people live on the call. Welcome, Dr. Day. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you, Joanna. And welcome everyone. So I don't want to, you know, if you talk about this whole scenario that we've been through, um, where I'd like to start is actually when I came to Canada and, and that was in the early seventies and um, I came and as a trainee in orthopedic surgery and for many years during my training and actually for seven or eight years after I started practice, um, the Canadian health system worked really well. Like there were no wait lists. If we had patients lining up, we treated them. If a patient was, if the operating rooms were going beyond normal hours, Everyone just stayed and treated the patients. That all started to change in the early to mid 1980s. Um, and um, I'm very careful not to, not to mix up correlation and causation, but um, the Canada Health Act came in in 1984, um, which I, you know, I often reference to George Orwell's book because it, it has been uh, probably one of the causes, if not, but not the only cause of, of what, what went on and what happened. So when I came to, to um, Vancouver as a trainee, if we would work as much as we liked, we would treat patients, there were no wait lists. It was, there was no shortage of doctors. We were actually one of the top countries in the world in access and numbers of physicians. We, we're somewhere between fourth and sixth in the number of physicians on a population basis. Nowadays, we're down at number 26 in the number of doctors on a population basis. And that's not an accident. Um, so what, what happened, and there was a commission in 1991 in British Columbia called the Seton Commission, which had a well-known economist as their lead um, person on health policy, and his name was Robert Evans. Remarkably for this day and age, his main strategy and the main recommendation of the Seton Commission was to cut back on nurses and doctors. Um, and as a result, um, medical schools were cut back across the country, not just in BC, because the rest of the country um, jumped onto this bandwagon and um, medical school intake was cut by 11% on average across the country. Lo and behold, today we have a shortage of doctors and the rationale for this cutback um, was that doctors and nurses were treating too many patients. And if you stop treating patients, costs will go down because costs were recognized as a, as a problem. This was uh, 1991. Um, it was also around this time that we started to ponder what we were going to do because um, I was at UBC. Um, I was involved with, um, with quotes, academic orthopedic surgery. I was traveling the world teaching and doing, doing research and away from my practice a lot, but we were heavily involved in research and doctors, include myself and my colleagues who were traveling around the world start to realize that we're we're falling behind in technology we're falling behind in patient care and we had to do something about it our my operating time at ubc hospital 
was cut back progressively year by year from 22 hours a week to five hours a week. The number of hours recommended for maintenance of competency by the Canadian Orthopedic Association was 13 and a half hours a week of operating time for a surgeon, orthopedic surgeon. So, um, and the other thing that was happening is that we were losing doctors and nurses to the United States because we wouldn't employ them here. So anyway, that's how that started. Um, we essentially, a group of us, and somewhat paradoxically inspired by the, um, inspired by the Seton Commission, and, and having been exposed to the, 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 the type of facility that we were going to develop, the Seton Commission recommended that hospital, came out with a conclusion also that hospitals were inefficient and, and public hospitals should build and, and um, close by private, not private, public day surgery centers or short stay surgery centers because they're more efficient. This was from evidence around. That was one good thing they, they did. Um, but the government didn't act on that because the last thing government wanted to do in reality was to expand capacity. Their, their basic premise was to ration access to healthcare. So a group of us, um, myself and, um, and some other doctors and some business leaders in, in Vancouver, um, for actually major philanthropists who supported the public health system. Uh, one of the things I said in, uh, we, together we um, built and developed a Canby Surgery Center, which at the time we built it was quite unusual in Canada. We opened right smack in the middle of a 10 year run of an NDP government and were it's interesting, and many of you might not recognize that or know that it's very common around the world that private sector healthcare expands under a left-wing government. Um, it's happened. It's happened in um, in many countries, including countries like Sweden. But anyway, we opened in 1996, and um, and functioned very well until. Uh, with the support of the government. Um, I've written on this and talked about this, but we had the support of the NDP government in private, but not in public, um, because they knew they were in trouble. So that started to go on and, um, but around, um, and wait lists got worse and access got worse and the number of health workers um, progressively dropped relative to the eight, population, including the aging population. So by 2007 or eight, um, uh, we've been operating then obviously for, for over 20 years. Um, the BC Nurses Union tried to get um, um, the government to force a stop to us. Now I will say on trade unions, um, it's not, it's not the trade unions that were necessarily opposing it, it was their leadership. And um, we actually had a poll when we opened Canby of unionized workers at UBC, and which they conducted, not the union, but the workers themselves. 95% supported what we were doing. Um, but anyway, so they tried to get the government of the day in, 2000, in, in, in the mid to late 2000s to enforce an act called the Medicare Protection Act, which was on the books, but was never acted upon and never put into practice. And that, um, that uh, uh, action went to court and the, the courts said that they didn't have standing. So then they, they hired a surrogate um, called um, Muriel Schuf because they had to tag the constitutional challenge onto an individual. And um, she, get, she actually was a witness at court, at court. But anyway, that's what forced us to respond with the constitutional challenge. And the constitutional challenge was based on the fact that as Joanna said, we are the only, and, and a lot of Canadians don't realize this, there is no country on earth in which there are jurisdictions, there are provinces or states or areas in which private health insurance is illegal. 
And um, you know, people often talk about the urban myth of, uh, but that's all it is that North Korea and Cuba outlaw private healthcare. They don't do not. I, I'm an honorary member of the Cuban Orthopedic Association. I've lectured there, taught there, and treated patients there. They, there's, this, there's a small hospital in downtown Havana that only does, um, it's kind of like a, a, a bigger version of Canby surgery. They generate $20 million a year in private revenue, 20 million US, and use that revenue to support the public system in, in treat, treat other Cubans. Uh, it's the sa same kind of thing happens in England where there's an NHS that our system was based on largely, um, but they have 10% of private insurance and a hospital, a famous cancer hospital in, in England called the Royal Marsden Hospital um, treats, um, treats private patients and they generate about $176 million a year and use the money to provide resources for public patients. Um, so getting on to that, we went we, we tried to launch this constitutional challenge. We were blocked over many years. It took from 2000, January of 2009 to September of 2016 to get into the courtroom. During that time, approximately 10 judges had dealings with our lawsuit. Um, judges were retiring or being promoted. And, um, and that was very frustrating for us um, because it slowed everything down, but then the government had a strategy um, right through the trial, the, the lead up to the trial, and right through the trial, of trying to put us out of business so that the, tr the constitutional challenge would disappear. And as, um, as you all know, um, constitutional challenges are very unjust in Canada because um, it's very hard to mount a constitutional challenge. There's almost, I would say, having gone through this process, there's almost no point in having a constitution um, because no individual can fight for their rights unless they can use a, a, a resource like the Canadian Constitution Foundation to back them up. Um, we were supported across the country through the foundation by many uh, individuals, thousands of donors, um, and um, that's in keeping with the fact that, and the, the CCF did a poll on this a couple of years ago, 80% in British, uh, across the country, 76% of the public want us to win this lawsuit, um, which is a remarkable statistic. In BC, it's 80%. Uh, it's a remarkable statistic, um, considering that all the governments are against it. So, and actually, when I say governments, um, are against it. They probably aren't. Um, I, I was in a debate two years ago in Quebec with the Quebec health minister at the time. And obviously he was supporting um, the public system. And I was, um, it, was in, in, it was in Montreal and I was speaking in favor of some choice and some element of, of, of private care, which is allowed in every other country. So he was quite strongly against it. Afterwards, he came up to me. So this was um, actually just before the case started, the constitutional case. He came up to me and says, you know, Brian, every health minister in the country wants you to win this lawsuit. But, but um, while I'm health minister, don't tell anyone I said that. Well, he's no longer health minister. And that is the kind of thing we found out. We've had leaders of the NDP at our treated at our clinic. We've had protesters on the lawns of our clinic with, with uh, TV cameras outside, holding microphones and giving talks against private healthcare who've actually paid and had treatment at our clinics. That's, that's the kind of hypocrisy that we see. As you know, there are prime ministers and premiers across the country who have utilized private care when they need it. Now I will say, and uh, getting back to this, just briefly to Canby, that our founding shareholders, some of them were very well-known um, philanthropists like Jack Poole, Milan Illich. Our founding um, shareholders and directors ha had donated over $100 million to the public health system in Canada. And, um, 
And, um, and that is just an indication that they believed that the public health system, as I do, would actually improve if there were a little bit of competition. So our lawsuit went on. I'll, I'll just go through quickly the lawsuit um, uh, and summarize um, not just the lawsuit, but the lead up to the trial and the trial, which is um, which just ended in February of this year, just fortunately before COVID um, otherwise. But it, it went on the whole process. Um, we started in January of 2009, we got into court in September of 2016, and we finished just this year. So that's, a, that's the struggle to fight for, for rights. And, and I must emphasize, this was not a case where we were the plaintiff. There were originally six or seven plaintiffs, um, mostly patients, um, and, um, and um, some of the patients died during the wait to get to trial. They were elderly patients, some of them. One was a younger patient. Three of our four plaintiffs by the time we got to trial had been children who had suffered. And one of the things I, I talk about, and it was talked about in our case, is that children have some of the worst access and worst health outcomes in Canada. They, um, there's, um, and this is not just me speaking, this is evidence at trial. Once we got into the trial, we were shocked <clears throat> at the strategy of the government because it was again, we shouldn't have been, because it was again to slow down the process, to stop evidence getting into the trial. As you all know, there was the Charlie case in 2000 that um, this decision came out in 2005 in Quebec. And um, that was somewhat of a precedent for us. We, were, we went further. Now, one of the things that happened in Quebec, even though all seven of the judges ruled that um, patients' rights were, if you, section, there was some violation of section seven rights because people were waiting an unnecessary time. They all agreed on that. They all agreed that people was, patients were suffering on wait lists. And of course, in Charlie, the, the Supreme, the head of the Supreme Court um, came out with the statement that um, Canadians are suffering and dying on wait lists. And, um, and that, ha that is the case more today than ever. We'll talk a bit about COVID in the questions because I know there's some, but um, um, we had evidence in our trial in one hospital region in British Columbia, 308 patients a year in one hospital region died on the wait list without getting treated. Um, extrapolated across the country, um, that amounts to um, eight, 18 a day. Um, and um, so there was a crisis in, and now it's going to get worse because of COVID. So we had, um, Thousand, we have thousands of patients in Canada dying each year on a public wait list without getting treated. With, and that is, I mean, this is a terrible thing to say in a way, but that's a cheap way for the government to handle wait lists and don't treat them, and let them go away. Um, so we, we had evidence at trial from many witnesses. The most remarkable thing is we, we, we brought in a lot of um, BC patients and doctors to, um, to give evidence about um, the, wait, the wait lists and the harms in British Columbia. The BC government did not call a single surgeon in British Columbia into evidence, um, even though our case was primarily about access to surgery. The BC government did not call a single patient. We called patients, so did, um, so did others. Um, they brought in experts from elsewhere. The definition of an expert seemed to be someone who can come from somewhere else and tell us something that we don't know about ourselves. And what happened next was um, we discovered that the British Columbia government had very detailed um, data on wait lists that they were trying to blockers from accessing. So we eventually had to call a hostile government witness to get this material into evidence, which we did. 
And it was, it was devastating for the government because the initial claim of the government was, was that wait lists weren't harmful and wait lists were manageable and costs were not a problem. Their own evidence, which we put into trial, their own evidence from uh, their witnesses showed that absolutely patients were suffering tremendously. Uh, statistics came out like 16 to 40% of patients with cancers, serious cancers, were not being treated in the time that the BC government had determined was the maximum time they should wait. Um, we found governments, this is all at trial, governments were falsifying waiting list data. So but it didn't really matter because they were bad enough anyway. But we had evidence from a, from a, a BC uh, hospital region they were supposed to measure the wait list from the time the doc, the surgeon put the patient in their office on the wait list to the time we had, and th this, has all been, this has all been documented at trial. They were supposed to measure the wait list from that time until the patient had the surgery. The regions in sending the data into the government, had the re hospital regions had been told to do a better job of wait list because of the trial. What they did was they changed the dates and this is in evidence in trial, that they were sending in falsified data. And then perhaps the most remarkable thing about the trial was that, and we, we did this in a way strategically, of course we had lots of evidence from experts of our own on the harms to patients, the, the nature of the health system, the fact that, that there was inequity and inequality in the existing system that we have and but then we and we had experts that from elsewhere as well as from British Columbia and uh, other parts of Canada who gave evidence on the private the existence of private um, healthcare in other countries and and basically uh, showing that Canada was performing very poorly. You know, no matter which poll you looked at almost, um, we were down at the bottom of the heap. We were, the, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, um, which is a government fund, federally government funded body, um, in collaboration with a group called the Commonwealth Fund, um, they have um, data showing that Canada is at the, bottom of the list of universal of countries with universal healthcare when it comes to things like access, doctors, patients getting treated, um, and so on. We were also at the bottom of the list in those countries on criteria like equity, which is um, which might which is put forward as one of the reasons why we have this government monopoly on the funding and delivery of hospital and physician services. So there are lots of ish, lots of evidence, but as I was about to get into, the evidence we relied on most in our final closing statements was evidence from the government's experts, because the, it back, they backfired on the government because we were able to have government experts opine and, and give evidence that we were right and the government was wrong. And that really, I think, was, was a shock to the, the judge and a shock, we hope it was a shock to the judge. And we, um, we would, uh, the media supported by us early on tried to have this trial televised on CPAC. As you know, in the States, trials like this would be televised in at the Supreme Court of Canada, the trials so it's televised on CPAC. And we tried to, um, we tried to have this trial televised um, and we supported it. The government refused to allow, uh, allow, allow it for, for obvious reasons. And this was clearly um, an open, decision not to not to be transparent to the public so it was never televised but we have records now from gov in the transcripts 
And that's what we relied on mostly for the last day of our final closing argument that um, the, so government experts from New Zealand, from Ireland, from Europe, from other parts of Europe, um, from um, the United States, all gave evidence that there's no country in the world in which there is any empirical evidence that the private sector will harm um, the public sector when they coexist in a universal system. We had evidence that wait lists um, in other countries were better, were, were much shorter than they are here. We had evidence that um, costs, the Canadian system, medical system is up near the top in costs. We also had in BC empirical evidence on workers' compensation board. Now, as you know, that the workers' compensation board, as well as other groups like the federal RCMP, uh, federal employees generally, uh, and, um, and um, remarkably federal prisoners um, are all allowed to access private healthcare and do. So, you know, one of the things I like to, to put this into context with is that we were in court fighting so that prisoners who are not in jail can have the same rights that, pe prison, that, that Canadians who are in jail have. Um, we had one of their witnesses, an expert um, in international health, um, give evidence that we were the only country in the world in which there are provinces that outlaw private health insurance. We, were, we had evidence in court that from their experts that, um, that well, one remarkable thing which we, we don't, didn't support was that the wealthy individuals paying more, this is a government expert, individuals who pay higher taxes should have priority to a health system when there are wait lists over those who pay lower taxes. That was a government expert. Um, and many things like that, we had um, support that it was unethical for a government and uh, um, to promise healthcare and not deliver it in a timely manner. I think that I'll, oh, I'll wind down there, but the evidence at trial was pretty well unequivocal. The the, I, 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 ho I fully expect that we will, we will, I'm confident that we will win the case as it goes through the various levels of the court process. Um, the, it will go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, we think. Unlike the Quebec case, which was decided primarily on the Quebec Charter, ours will be precedent setting for the rest of Canada. Um, we can, I, I think that um, we will we, we will see a vast improvement in Canada's public health system, public health system, once there is a little bit of competition because I don't know of any monopoly in any field anywhere that supports consumers better than, than um, a system where there's some competition and, and some, uh, uh, some allowance for the public to see what else can happen. And that's one of the, you know, I'll end with a, with a personal story. My sister came to visit from the UK um, at Christmas and she was very angry because she'd had a hip replacement under the National Health Service. And she was angry because she had to wait seven weeks to get a hip replacement from the time she saw the doctor. Um, the, the reason she was angry is she used to work for the government as a civil servant and, in, and she used to have private health care, and it would only have been three weeks uh, if she, under the private system in the UK. So that's the kind of anecdote, I mean, that's an anecdotal uh, evidence, but, um, but we know that um, countries like Britain, Quebec, provinces like Quebec now, since Chowley, um, they have a care guarantee. And um, that if there's a care guarantee, which a lot of countries have, where if you wait beyond a certain time, the government is responsible for sending you 
to another jurisdiction, if necessary, public or private, to get treatment. That is, um, that is one of the things that the Senate committee argued for. It was not, uh, no government has, um, has introduced it, but, um, but um, it might be one of the things that governments can do in the future. So I'm gonna stop now and, and, and let uh, Joanna take over with some questions and, and um, I'll find you the answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Day. That was very uh, informative and gave a lot of history since prior to this litigation, which has an ancient history of its own. Uh, that was very useful. So let's get into some of these, these questions. The first question is from Karen Dockrell, who I see is on the call. Welcome, Karen. Uh, she had a few questions, but the first is quite specific. So as context, as you're aware, and as a uh, most people on this call may be aware of or not, that BC Health Minister Adrian Dix made some remarks a few months ago mid-pandemic that BC private clinics were going to be an important part of the government's strategy in catching up on the backlog of canceled surgeries and treatments because of the pandemic. And they estimated it would take about two years to catch up. So I think it's in this context that Karen is asking her question. The BC government is asking private clinics to help catch up on COVID cancellations. Will those clinics be given a facility fee to help cover costs for services in addition to MD fees? And her next question is, how does this request for help play out in your current legal challenge with BC? And her last question was, how can we assure a positive message coming out in moving private choice forward? Okay, so <clears throat> I don't have to tell anyone, um, take everything you hear from government with a pinch of salt. Um, uh, we've recently heard announcements from the government that volume of surgeries are almost back to normal. <clears throat> um, actually, if you check with the, saw, with, the, with the hospitals, that's no, absolutely untrue. Um, so I'll just, before I get to the real question, um, I'll give you a strategy that government hospitals have been told to do, and um, and that is to focus on very short surgeries. So then there'll be more numbers done, and it'll make the figures look better. Um, so we've had surgeons who've been told to do all of the very short procedures as soon as you can, so that we can put out statistics showing that the volume of surgeries has gone up but don't do those long six or seven hour operations. And um, we, um, but so the contracted out cases, yes, the facilities will get a, um, a fee from the government on contracts. So the first contracted out cases in BC were in, we, we, we did with the government. We used to do contracted surgery for the government. Um, we don't do any now. Um, the government has made a policy that if you treat private patients, which we do, um, we, um, uh, we do that despite, uh, despite the fact that government, in the middle of the trial actually, tried to introduce ten to $20,000 fines for any doctor that treated a private patient. Um, we were successful in getting an injunction in mid-trial to stop, to, to stop that penalty. But, um, but the, and we could talk about that injunction later if you wish, um, but the government policy is that if you treat any private patients, we will not, um, we will not do, give you contracts. They, the capacity is not there in these public, in the, in the, in the remaining public facilities. The, the numbers being done are may seem higher than normal because they're, they're, they're contracting out, again, short, very quick procedures to make the numbers look better. Actually, what was interesting is the judge in our case was a, someone who had contracted out surgery by the government. Um, he had a surgery carried out at what, not at our clinic, at another private clinic. Um, one of the points I like to raise is if the government has the right to say, I, you're on a long wait list and I'm going to send you to a private clinic about your own health, how on earth can we deny an individual the, same, the right to do the same thing if, if they are not one of the chosen few? 
but anyway, so I don't think that, I think that contracting out is a good thing. I think government should be involved in that. I think the public sector can, private sector can help the public sector with contracting out. It's not new. There's no way that the figures that the, the BC government or the Canadian government for that matter have come out with are realistic. And um, there is an independent study that's been published from um, out of McMaster just recently on the COVID um, related wait lists, which projects that wait lists, current wait lists will rise by 700% as a result of COVID. And that we're looking at, in other words, an, a procedure that might have taken six months wait lists previously is now going to be three and a half years. And interestingly, the, the author, one of the authors of that paper <clears throat> is a very closely linked uh, colleague uh, with one of the opposing witnesses, anti-private sector witnesses in our case. They have not proposed using private options, but they have come out with modeling that shows a 700% rise as a result of COVID. This COVID crisis um, is far worse in terms of its impact than, than, than we are hearing. I, I think many of you will know that um, I talked earlier about the, the um, 308 um, patients dying on a wait list in, in one hospital region in British Columbia. Um, that extrapolated then to 6,400 a year in, um, in, in Canada, which was 72,000 since, since the K our case started, died while waiting. <clears throat> that number has risen significantly during the <clears throat> COVID crisis. Patients have been dying of other reasons, other causes, uh, non-COVID causes, because they haven't been able to access healthcare. So, so yes, I think the contracting out is a good thing. No, it's not going to solve it because we don't have the infrastructure. One of the points that Canadians need to understand is, and part of the the panic with the COVID crisis was that we are ranked near the bottom of the, in a study of 35 countries, um, we were second to last in hospital beds per population, second to last. Um, that, and even with our hospitals, an OECD study has shown that Canadian hospitals, when a patient is admitted, treated and discharged from a Canadian hospital, it costs double the OECD average. We're spending double the OECD average. Um, and more than twice, well over twice as much as France and Germany does on a hospitalized patient. Um, these are, you know, there are various reasons for these uh, administrative costs and, and inefficiencies. Um, I, I, there's one thing I should point out we are often told the advantage of the single payer quote system that we allegedly have, we don't have a single payer system, is cheaper administration. At the Canadian Medical Association in 2008, we had a presentation from Dr. Barry Turgeon who used freedom of information data to access the true administrative costs of, of the health system in British Columbia. They claim, the government claimed it to be two or 3% it showed that it was 16% administrative costs. So without, uh, I think we have to take with a grain of salt everything we hear from the government um, on, on healthcare, the protective of the data, they try to hide data from the, from, the, from the judge, from the courts, from the public in our trial. They didn't want transparency in the courtroom. They wouldn't let cameras in to let the people see what's going on. So. I'm very skeptical. We won't know anything about what we shouldn't, shouldn't have done with COVID for two or three years from now, when we look back. As a fellow called Lawrence just said recently, you can put 100 COVID experts in a room and get 85 different opinions from the experts. And that's why we don't know and we won't know.
Okay, this question may be, thank you very much for that, Dr. Day. This question, I think, will be a pretty uh, brief response. Uh, is there someplace online, this is from Jim McIntosh, who's also on the call, welcome. Is there someplace online where I can find out how many people have died before they got to the top of the waiting list by province and or Canada-wide? I think the answer is no, because no. of the government, yeah. Governments yeah. want, we, we had to bring a hostile government witness to get that information just for a few health regions in BC. Yeah, yeah, abs uh, no, but we know it's a lot. And, and, you know, there are other areas, not just hospital wait lists. We know that, as you know, Canadian cities have a big problem with, um, with mental health and with um, access, with um, drug, o drug overdose deaths. Those have gone up remarkably. Uh, since COVID, so lo not just hospital wait lists. Um, there will be there will be a lot of data that should be available that we may never get access to. Thank you. Uh, question sent in advance. Uh, this is our last advanced question. Then we'll get to the questions in the chat. This is from Gregor Caldwell. Welcome, Gregor. Uh, prior to COVID, the average wait time for elective surgeries in Canada was well beyond medically accept acceptable wait times. There is talk of reducing the backlog when the priority on COVID has diminished. How is that possible when we had a backlog before COVID-19? Your comment earlier about taking what governments say with a grain of salt comes to mind. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah, the, the, well, just that, that the wait lists are incredible now. And we cannot, you know, it, it gets back to the infrastructure. We, we have, we're way at the bottom of developed countries in the number of hospital beds. Um, I like to point out that that um, you know Roy Romano, whose commission in 2002 is well known, he was appointed commissioner of of um, of this um, commission. And by the way, there have been over 300 commissions on healthcare in, in, in Canadian healthcare, and he closed 52 hospitals when he was premier of, of Saskatchewan in Saskatchewan. So we have a massive lack of infrastructure in, in Canada. Um, in China, other countries have actually used um, private sector hospitals. When, when the pandemic started, we offered Canby um, at no cost to the public, to Vancouver Coastal, the public hospitals to use if they wished, because we were closed for elective surgery. We said you, we, we offered it. In other countries, private, hospitals which don't really ex which do not exist in Canada um, were used um, to to provide that safety valve in the um, in the co for the COVID patients one of the things that I do like to remind everyone of is communist China most hospitals in communist China are private hospitals I mean we don't have any in, in um, in Canada, it's it it is this unique status um, that um, that somehow we've chosen healthcare. We've ch we allow private education. We allow private um, and independent and religious schools in Canada. And I, I, I but we have this massive bureaucracy of fourteen or more health ministries and health ministers. Uh, 200 uh, for a pop 14 health ministers for a population of 36 million whereas countries like Germany and France would double almost double the population and um, have one and, and our our um, our system is consumed by this bureaucracy and um, and it's very expensive thank you so we have a few questions in the chat, and if you have additional questions, you can pop them in the chat. This is an interesting question from Tabitha Ewart. Welcome, Tabitha. What would be best for Canada's healthcare going forward? Amending the Canada Health Act, and would you be concerned about subsequent parliaments undoing those amendments and creating uncertainty, or repealing the Canada Health Act altogether? And if so, how would provinces manage the cost of healthcare? So I'll make just a few brief comments, because this yeah. is a quite legalistic uh, question. The first comment is that, in fact, in our litigation, we are not challenging the Canada Health Act, and it's actually our position that 
private health care can coexist with the Canada Health Act. The issue is in BC, it's the Medicare Protection Act, which is provincial legislation, which effectively prevents doctors from working in the private system. And most provinces have equivalent provisions. And so our position is that those provisions violate section seven and section 15 of the charter, the rights to life, liberty and security of the person because they prevent individuals from taking their health into their own hands and deciding if that they want to seek private treatment and section 15 because there's a, a disproportionate effect on equality of outcomes. Section 7 is our main argument. Now, if the Supreme Court, we do expect that after the trial decision is rendered, whatever the result, and we hope that it will be in our favor, uh, but whatever the result, this is going to end up at the Supreme Court of Canada. And if the Supreme Court makes a determination that these provisions are unconstitutional, all, all provinces will have to bring their legislation into line with that. And Parliament, uh, arguably, they could bring in legislation um, with the notwithstanding clause, but these types of, pro of provisions are really under the provincial jurisdiction for management of health care. Uh, do you have any other comments about that, Dr. Day? So, so the remedy is not to amend the Canada Health Act, but to declare any government action which, effective, which has the practical effect of barring access to private care is unconstitutional. And that will be a durable effect that government will not be able to interfere with. Yeah, I mean, I do think that um, that the whole, I mean, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Everything you said is correct. But I think just more on a political basis, we don't really need the Canada Health Act. Constitutionally, health care is under the jurisdiction of the provinces. And there's no, uh, there's no Canada Education Act. We don't need a federal minister of health. We've got enough with the provinces and the territories. Um, you might argue if we're a single country, maybe we should not have, we should put health in the, but in, in the realm of the federal government, but that's not our constitution. It's not going to happen. So we, we no more need Health Canada and the federal ministry of health than we need, than we need a federal ministry of education. And what, if we stopped all of the money going in healthcare going towards the federal government's departments of health and just sent the money back, let the money stay in the provinces, they'd be much better off. There's a whole bureaucracy in Ottawa that we don't need. And, um, and I think that, uh, that uh, even then, then there's, there's still a lot more as, as you know, one of the studies that's, that we tried to get in at trial, and I don't think it is, was that um, for every health bureauc for every public health bureaucrat that there is in Germany, Canada has 11 public health bureaucrats. So that is, um, that is a problem because they cost, it costs a lot of money. And you know, I know how we all love to hit on administrators and, and, and bureaucrats, but, but the, 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 the system is very inefficient that we have. We know that. We, we know that, but, and just to give you a little insight into Germany, it was actually brought up by, our, um, by one of our opposing witnesses that evidence in Germany shows that where there's a public and a private system coexisting, the wait lists are longer in the private system. And they, they produced a study, but didn't go through the study well, we did, and when you go through the study, you find that the wait list for a private MRI in Germany was one week or less, uh, was, was less than a week, and the wait list for a public MRI was two weeks. It's kind of the same thing as with my sister. Yes, it's double, but, it's, but they, the, the problem is, do we want equality where everyone suffers? Do we want to bring everyone down? Or do we want some inequality and yet everyone is better off by far. That's what, that's what the situation is in countries like Germany. I lived in Switzerland. In Switzerland, they have universal healthcare with a twist. There is basically no government um, insurance, no government insurance, uh, the government, but the government pays the premiums for low-income groups that can't afford the insurance. So, so there's, there are, you, 
we, we have far too much government involvement in our health system. And on the federal government thing, yes, sure, they should be involved in pandemics where there are cross-border infections and so on. But when it comes to whether you should get your hernia fixed, I don't think the, the federal government should have any role in that under our constitution. Thank you, Dr. Day. So this is an important question from Andy Crook, CCS board chairman. Welcome, Andy. What has been uh, the effect of the Quebec decision? So that's RV Chow, the Chowley decision, which I linked to in the chat. Has there been a practical result of freeing medical services in Quebec? And just before you answer that, Dr. Day, I'll just mention why does Chowley not apply to the rest of Canada? Well, we think that it should, but indeed the Supreme Court of Canada accepted a very similar argument to the argument that we're making in this case in BC. However, a plurality of judges decided it under the Quebec Charter. Quebec has its own charter rather than the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And that's why it does not have universal application. And that's why this case will apply to every Canadian. But do you have any insight on what's actually happening on the ground in Quebec? Well, well, yeah, what's interesting is, yes, we had a witness from Quebec, an opposing witness, an opposing expert um, called Marie Primont, who testified that the good, res the good thing that came out of Charlie was that um, the Quebec government was forced to introduce a care guarantee. And that means you're guaranteed treatment within a certain time and if you can't provide it you can you get sent to another jurisdiction that was a direct result of charlie charlie um peter hogg who sadly has died this year and um, is widely recognized i think as canada's outstanding constitutional lawyer he opined that the charlie case should apply and does apply outside of quebec even though it was under the canadian charter and actually, Marie Deschamps, the Supreme Court of Canada judge who was involved in that, had said that she, she, did, not, she did not need to rule on the Canadian Charter because the, the two were so similar. But it, and then, of course, the other thing is, as you know, Quebec did not obey, if, you, if, you use, if I can use that word, the ruling of the Supreme Court of Canada. It introduced private insurance only for hip and knee replacements and cataracts. Well, who's, no insurance company is going to sell that. And, and, and what it means is that if I wanted to, I could set up a private insurance company in Quebec and offer insurance for everything because the Quebec government would not be able to stop me. Uh, I was told um, secretly, if you like, that the reason the Quebec government, that the reason no insurance company has gone into Quebec and offered full premiums is that they've been threatened with loss of all other government business if they do if they do that. Um, so so I think it's certainly not precedent setting, but it has um, a government witness um, showed that um, uh, gave evidence that actually the Quebec system has benefited from the Charlie system, Charlie changes, which the gov government government the defendant in our trial didn't like hearing that from their own witnesses. Thank you. So we are at 12 o'clock. If anybody would like to pop in the chat and I can unmute you and you can ask a question, we probably have time for one more question. Um, otherwise, you can always reach out to me, Jay Barron, at the ccf.ca if you have any questions. Oh, uh, Karen Selleck has her uh, hand raised. So I'm going to unmute you or ask to unmute you. Ask to unmute and you can pop on. Yep. Um, hi, Dr. Day. I recall hi, at one time you were um, uh, asking for disclosure of how much the BC government had spent on defending the lawsuit. What was the outcome of that? Did you ever get an answer? And is that, is, has, have the appeals on that been exhausted or are you not pursuing it anymore? I think Joanna can answer that. Yes, thank you for the question, Karen. So actually, the appeal on that, so uh, as Karen referenced, we brought a freedom of information request to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. That office, the administrator, approved our request and ordered the BC government to disclose their costs. The government appealed that decision to a judge, and the judge overturned it on the basis that 
um, solicitor client privilege could be violated, i.e. the government could disclose confidential information, even though we were only seeking a global sum, not any type of detailed dockets. But yes, the government, uh, the government's lawyers do act as, as lawyers for the government. So there is a lawyer client uh, relationship there. Uh, in any event, we certainly appealed that decision. It was heard via Zoom just a few weeks ago by the BC Court of Appeal, and we expect a decision within the next few months because we certainly think that it should, would be a terrible precedent if government litigation costs, which we, uh, Dr. Day can tell you, in court every day, we had two of our lawyers and the government had about 20 lawyers. So the, the, the costs were certainly colossal and uh, certainly the BC public has a right to know how their tax money is being spent. Uh, so with that, I will wrap up. I've put in the chat a few times yourhealthcantwait.ca, which is our dedicated website with information about the case. It has information about how you can donate if you're inclined to, which is one way that you can tangibly support the case. And thank you, Edgargo, for asking how you can support the case. You can donate. Um, you can also stay engaged with us on our list. We may have different ways that you can support the case via petitions or other things as this process moves forward. We will need the support of you as we go through the appellate process. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. So we expect a decision, I think, as Dr. Day said, the trial wrapped up in February of this year. The judge is now working full time on the decision. We know he has a dedicated lawyer helping him with it. And so we expect the decision in the near future. And if you're on our list, you'll be the first to know and uh, please stay in touch with us. So thank you so much, especially to Dr. Day. Thank you to everybody who attended uh, and we'll see you soon. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Eddie. <laughs>